I do want to thank uh, Cheryl for the song. It re brings me back. It's uh, uh, 25 plus years ago, and for years thereafter, I worked with the Father's Resource Center. And one of the one of the wise uh, uh, bits of of uh, uh, wise sayings that I've been able to pass along over the years was from the founder of the organization, who said, "The rainbows follow the storm." As we heard in this song, we're in the middle of the storm. and We don't always feel <laughs> the benefits that come, but the rainbows often come after the storm. So I want to thank you for that special music. I've been to a number of funerals over the past 50 years. My parents didn't let us kids go to funerals because they weren't sure if we'd act up or not. My parents had four boys in five years, so I'm sure we were a handful uh, to manage. And many of, uh, in fact, most of those funerals that I've attended have not been within our church fellowship. But one of the most common prayers I've heard recited is what's called the Lord's Prayer. Indeed, more than once I've heard the officiant at the funeral recite the model prayer and ask people to join together for the model prayer, and most people knew it. Now, this has been over the years. I don't know if young people know it anymore. Well, during the Middle Ages... From 500 to 1500 A.D., the prisoners who were condemned to capital punishment, whether it was to be hung or beheaded, they often had their hands bound and they were marched off to the gallows. And walking alongside the condemned prisoner would be a clergyman. And the clergyman knew the exact number of steps to the gallows and then would recite what they called the Lord's Prayer so that the prayer was completed along those steps by the time then they reached that execution platform. And I suspect both the clergyman and the prisoners did not realize that the model prayer, or as they call it, the Lord's Prayer, as what is often referred to in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, and we're going to go through that today, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, it actually reiterates the Ten Commandments and outlines the plan of God for salvation of mankind. Well, today we're going to look at the 66 words that compose the model prayer and he see how they synchronize or match up with the Ten Commandments. We're going to examine how the model prayer in Matthew 6 is a restatement of the plan of God and the, about the salvation of mankind and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Well, we can entitle this message, The Model Prayer and the Ten Commandments. Now, it's entirely fitting on a weekend when we honor fathers with the upcoming Father's Day that we focus our prayerful relationship with our spiritual father. I was reading a book by W. Philip Keller called The Layman Looks at the Lord's Prayer. And I was going through it and examining this model prayer in a number of different ways and decided today I would look at the 66 words as they are in the King James Version of the Bible. These 66 words can be recited in less than a minute. It's a favorite passage for many people. And I, when I was young, I learned it uh, and memorized it in the old King James language. Perhaps most of us have heard it that way as well. So I'm going to refer to the old King James Version commonly today. It's instinctive for me to do that although other scriptures are maybe used in the New King James or other translations. So let's take a quick look at Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. In, in verse 9, Matthew 6, After this manner, therefore, pray you, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I want to note, as we're looking at the model prayer, it starts out talking about loving God in the first few lines. Later in the prayer, it talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. If we take a look at Matthew 19, in verse 19, it really gives us the essence in one verse of what this prayer outlines. In Matthew 19 and verse 19, we read, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This really encapsulates what Jesus Christ was trying to get across when he put forth the model prayer. 
So there are two general categories. When Christ spoke often of loving God and loving neighbors yourself, it fits into that pattern. So we can divide the 66 words of the model prayer uh, in 10 sections or phrases, which will become the 10 points of our analysis today. Or in the words of our neighboring elder in Missouri, Mr. Pierwitz, when I get to point nine, you'll know I'm almost over. Now, but bear in mind, each of these points will not take the same amount of time. If I spend 40 minutes on point one, you don't project it out and say nine times to see another six hours to go or whatever. That's unnecessary uh, projection. Um, each point will be a different length. I want to start out then with the first phrase of this prayer, what we call the model prayer, with the expression. And so this would be point one, the expression, our Father. Just two words. And the term is an identifier. It doesn't say uncle, aunt, niece, uh, cousin, sister, brother, kindly neighbor, or some other person. It says our Father. In fact, if we refer to the Ten Commandments and we take a look at the Ten Commandments, we find that they start out with an identifier. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 6, uh, we can begin the Ten Commandments. In Deuteronomy 5, 6, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So this Ten Commandment starts right off with an identifier. It answers the question, who is this? When it speaks of our Father in the model prayer, it just doesn't say a Father. It says our Father. Christ is saying our, the O-U-R, because God the Father is our spiritual Father, and of course, that would then make Christ our spiritual brother. The Apostle Paul used the term our Father to describe the relationship between church members and God. If we turn to Colossians 1 in verse 2, in Colossians 1 in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is referring to fellow church members using the same term that Christ used when Christ said, Our Father. So this term, Our Father, is used in the Bible to describe, uh, but this also used to describe other uh, familial relationships. In Matthew 3, in verse 9, we're going to look at this term, Our Father. <clears throat> in Matthew 3, in verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father, for I say to you, God is able to make up these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, people say, well, Abraham our father. Well, what are they referring to? It's the same term, our father. They're referring to uh, uh, as an ancestor. We can take a look at Romans 9 in verse 10. In Romans 9, and verse 10, we have another use of this expression, our Father. In Romans 9, 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So here again, we see a reference to someone who is called our father. Abraham's called our father. His son Isaac is called our father. And so we're getting the pattern that father means an ancestor. It's someone from whom we've descended. We can read further in, in John 4 and verse 12. In John 4 and verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So we have this other person, the next one in, uh, generationally, who's referenced as our father Jacob. Well, now we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob referenced as our father. And then when Christ Jesus Christ is praying, he's praying to our Father. He's in a, noticing who came before them. Who was the cause for them to be here? It's an expression, but of course, when Jesus Christ says it, he openly said he was referring to God, our Father. King David is also referred to as our Father in Mark 11 and verse 10. In Mark 11, verse 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So here again, we have this idea of who came before us and is a reason 
that we are here. So there are people throughout history that God has chosen who are our spiritual ancestors. He refers to as our fathers, but certainly none greater than God the Father. So uh, the term our father then defines our relationship with God. It explains who we are in comparison to God and who he is in comparison to us. The uh, I've discovered through my work at the Father's Resource Center uh, with over 200 uh, uh, family uh, father cases um, that it's a profound experience to discover in what you learn what people think of their father. I found that people instinctively think of God in the same way they think of their own physical father. And what many people think of their fathers, when they think of that, they think of the imperfections of the average human being or maybe below average human being. So the strange part of it is they then attribute those subconsciously attribute those aspects to God, which is why people then let other people come in between them and their relationship with God. In the words of the author, uh, Philip Keller, who wrote the author of The Lord's Prayer, uh, a book by that title, he says, some people sub unconsciously transfer to God the image of all the negative attributes in their own mind about human fathers. Well, how often do People transfer their thoughts about the physical father's attributes to God. It really depends on their own relationship with their father. Let's take a look at some statistics. In America, about one-third of all Caucasian babies, it's actually closer to 40%, are born to unwed mothers. The babies don't grow up with their biological fathers. 60 to 70% of babies are born to uh, uh, married parents. Up to half of those then become children of divorce. This puts the number of Caucasian children growing up without their biological fathers at about two-thirds. About one-third grow up with their biological parents. I will say that as a teacher, uh, I could pretty much assume that half of the kids were in blended families or single-parent households. The ratios are different for other ethnicities. For black Amer American children growing up with their, without their biological father in the home, it's even higher. Currently, about 70% of black babies are born out of wedlock. This means about 30% are born to married parents. And then, about half of those children from those married parents eventually become children of divorce, which means about 85% of black children are growing up without their father. And then there are those who don't even know they're being raised by their, or who aren't being raised by their biological father. There was a startling statistic about DNA testing in a California study above children of divorce. About a fourth of the children who were tested found that the biological father listed on their birth certificate wasn't, or wasn't listed on their birth certificate. The DNA test showed or the blood test showed somebody else was the father. In most cases, the biological father didn't even know he was the biological father of what turned out to be his own children. I personally know at least three men who did not even know they were fathers until their biological children had become adults and then had children of their own, and then they sought out their own ancestry because they now saw the next generation coming along. In the book of Hosea, in the Bible, we read about such tragic situations with Hosea's wife Gomer and their children, and it follows the same pattern of 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 children not having the father of the husband and wife. And this explains this terribly awkward statistic of why 25% of children in America will spend some time being raised by grandparents or other relatives. I know my mother was raised by her grandparents for the first six years of her life. My father-in-law was raised by his great aunt and his great uncle. That's because his mother died in childbirth, leaving a baby and a young father. The new father, my future father-in-law, or uh, my, my future father-in-law's dad, then relied on relatives to help him care for this new baby while he was working. And the baby was passed around from one relative to another uh, until the father then remarried about four or five years later. Uh, at that point, the new stepmother said she wasn't going to raise a stepson. 
uh, uh, who was between four and five years old, she wanted her own family, not a constant reminder of a child from a previous family. So the boy's father and the new wife moved all away from the Ozarks and off to California, and they raised a separate family and left a little boy behind in southern Missouri. The little boy, who would someday become my father-in-law, was then raised by an elderly couple uh, who didn't have their children of their own. They were a great aunt and uncle. But that elderly couple then doted on him, and he was able to excel in life. But what do you suppose went through my father-in-law's mind when he was just a little boy? What do you suppose he had in his mind when he heard the words, Our Father? Remarkably, he grew up to be a kind and a loving father himself, and I was privileged to meet him before he died. How do you suppose that those 68% or more of Caucasian children or 85% of black children who spend time growing up fatherless feel about the words, our father. Can you imagine the term? Our father evokes warm, fuzzy images of a, of a doting, considerate parent who's always there? Or is it one of coolness and distance, perhaps absence? As a result, it's not easy for a pleasant thing for many people to think of God as their father. They're more likely to think of a distant person, someone who has other interests, perhaps doesn't have their interest at heart. Instinctively, many people have doubts about their physical father, so this raises issues in their minds about whether they are really loved. Does their father really care? And it's common to think about flaws in humans and then attribute those flaws to God the Father. <clears throat> Tragically, many fathers are separated from their children because it's become a societal norm that a high percentage of families have become single-parent households or blended families families who have mixed parentage children. And to be fair, not all children suffer the same debilitating effects through separation from their fathers, but the numbers are significant. There's a biblical prophecy that comes to mind, and it may have come to your mind already. In the prophecy uh, by the prophet Malachi in Malachi 4, he said it would be critical for the heart's of the fathers and children to be turned to each other. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. In Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. But we're seeing a lot of that curse now because it clearly hasn't been accomplished. Because if that prophecy of Malachi 4 were already fulfilled, well, then the fathers and children would already have their hearts turned toward each other and there'd be no reason for them to turn back toward each other. And so we just look at the curses we're living with today as a result of estrangement between fathers and children. Since the 60s, essentially 65, 1965 and on, the government has become the substitute husband and substitute father uh, uh, through many American social programs. Because those programs, uh, uh, of those programs, there's been an increasing lack of closeness between fathers and children. And the lack of closeness can breed anger and bitterness or resentment and often forms the basis for self-loathing or discontent or personally destructive habits and antisocial behavior. Fatherless brings about an attitude of, you owe me. And we see this when people demand things from their false father, the government. You owe me becomes their attitude. While many children are separated from their physical father, many people today are also separated in their own minds, whether they realize it or not, from their spiritual father. That's one of the reasons we have a holy day, an annual holy day called the Day of Atonement, or at one representing a reuniting with the, our spiritual father. So the first uh, uh, phrase of the model prayer is synchronous with the first commandment listed in Deuteronomy 5. Uh, <clears throat> so when we read that first phrase in Matthew 6, in the model prayer, in uh, Matthew 6, 9, after this manner, therefore, pray you our father. So then, just as we saw in Deuteronomy 5, we see an identifier of who we're talking about. We're talking about the, I am the Lord your God, that appears back in Deuteronomy, and then goes on into the Ten Commandments uh, to further describe what, who God is and what he expects. 
The first commandment of the Ten Commandments is restated by Jesus in Matthew, in Mark 12 and verse 30. In Mark 12 and verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Well, we can apply this statement of Christ as in Mark, from Mark 12 to the first four or actually five of the Ten Commandments about loving God. And it applies even to Commandment 5, which is honor your father and your mother, because not only is it an identifier, but shows that we are to honor God and put God first and show our love to him. So the two words, our father and the model prayer, are not just in tune with the first commandments, as to accepting and recognizing God, but are in tune with the other commandments also. In this case, those two words, our Father, Christ is making it clear that God is our common spiritual Father. Christ didn't simply say, my Father. He said, our Father. And then, of course, with the Father comes inheritance. And with Jesus Christ's relationship to his Father, we are brought into a family relationship. In Romans 8, verse 29, in Romans 8, 29, <clears throat> Paul wrote to the Romans about that family relationship. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Well, Paul's letter to the Roman church explained that Jesus didn't exclude those of us who are eager to be members of God's family. It, it said Jesus was to be the firstborn. In Hebrews 12 and verse 23, uh, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 23 goes on to say, who does he address the letter to? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Well, does this sound familiar? The firstborn of many brethren? And now the writers of Hebrews is saying church of the firstborn. Um, <clears throat> well, our church, our assembly, those of us who are gathered here today, whether in person or on the webcast or hearing it later, are referred to as the church of the firstborn. So point one summary is Jesus Christ referred uh, God to God as our Father. Those are the first two words, and that's point one. It's referred to in the model prayer as it's referred to in the first commandment in describing God as our Father, as an identifier. Then we look at the next phrase, uh, who art in heaven. So this would be point two. This phrase is also an identifier. It says, it answers the question, well, which God are we talking about? Well, it's God our Father, but here it says it's the God in heaven. Now, there's often confusion as to what heaven is. Uh, in Isaiah 55, in Isaiah 55 and verse 10, it helps to resolve some of that. <clears throat> For as the rain comes down and, the sn and snow from heaven and returns not, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So it's talking about the first heaven the place where it rains from. And some of us have had plenty of rain in this past week. I know I've dumped my feed pans out for the sheep several times. Uh, and I can measure the rainfall that way, four inch pans, and I can stick the ruler in and see what my, like a big rain gauge. And if I left the wheelbarrow out, it's really going to fill uh, this last week. And there was certainly a lot of thunder. But that's from the first heaven. But the Bible speaks of three heavens. The one in Isaiah 10 is the one that most people commonly speak of. And that is the atmosphere, where the rain comes from, the birds fly in. We look in Psalm 19 in verse 1, in the New King James, in Psalm 19, verse 1. We have a statement, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Well, this is referring to the universe where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. We're looking up in the heavens uh, as the writer was in Psalm 19 and verse 1, and where the sun and the moon and the stars are, where the, beyond where the immediate atmosphere of the earth is, which is referring to the second heaven. I remember backpacking and camping in the Cascade Mountains, heading up uh, 
uh, to a, a mountaintop. And lying there, no tent, just threw down a tarp and a sleeping bag and looking up. And the air is pretty clear when you get up near up in the mountain. It's cold, so you want that tarp to wrap around both on top and bottom of your sleeping bag. And you look up in the sky, and it's very clear. There's no clouds up there. You can see the stars more than you can uh, under 10,000 feet. And it's really a, a remarkable experience. Uh, then you think of Psalm 19 and verse 1, and the heavens declare the glory of God. There's also some interesting uh, interferences there. Uh, and every 45 minutes, you see a satellite come bleeding through the uh, through the sky. We don't always see them here. So when the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 12, he writes and he's telling about an experience that he had. And he, he states he isn't quite sure what's going on, but he reveals a little bit more about heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So we have this statement uh, here directly that there are three heavens and that God the Father then is in heaven. We know that. Because we read in Matthew 5.16 a direct statement in Matthew 5.16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, that could actually refer to all three heavens. Now, couldn't it? The glory of God. Because how many of you have created a bird that can fly through the atmosphere? Uh, and so forth. The Apostle John, the writer of the book of Revelation, was granted a special view, a vision of the third heaven, and he described it as best he could for us in Revolution, Revelation 4 and verse 2. In Revelation 4 and verse 2, we have a little more description of this third heaven. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Well, this is a description then that the Apostle John gave of the godly throne, a place where God's throne exists. We're not talking about the atmosphere where the birds fly. We're not talking out there where the uh, satel uh, satellites, the sun, moon, and stars are going, uh, you know, outside the Earth's atmosphere. We're talking about the third heaven, the place where God's throne exists. Jesus Christ was pointing to a certain God when he referred to our Father who art in heaven, to a Father, a God that resides in heaven where his throne is, uh, in the th where the place of the throne of God is in the third heaven. There's another factor in this reflection as to who the identity of God is. And in the world, we've had, a, uh, uh, for the last 6,000 years of recorded history of man, for the most part, they don't really know God. So what God are we talking about? They usually put a small g on that word, perhaps a stone god, maybe one of made of wood. My wife and I saw a lot of chiseled stone gods when we visited Buddhist and Shinto temples in Japan. And we saw many. We went on a tour of many different uh, of those temples. And people were worshiping statues. They were made of bronze or copper. Some of the statues were carved of various hardwoods, and they were polished very smooth. Some it's because people would touch the belly of the Buddha or the shoulder of the arm. And over time, they would be worn quite smooth and the oil on the person's hand would, uh, would essentially polish it. Thousands and thousands of touches. Some of the statues were overlaid with silver or gold. All of these pagan gods were on the ground. None of them, none of these gods were in any of the three heavens. Okay. Elijah the prophet of God at the time of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel uh, in the divided kingdom time in the northern kingdom of Israel, it was about 700 years before Christ was born, had a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Baal was a pagan deity, a pagan god. In fact, the Baals, there was a, a pagan god in each, uh, each area, each physical area, whether it was a separate nation. 
And so they would worship the local Baal uh, gods. And we read about this in 1 Kings 18. I'll just summarize it. When Ahab, uh, and starting out of verse 17, Ahab uh, referred to Elijah and he said, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Well, uh, the Ahab, King Ahab, of course, is with the evil king and an evil wife. Uh, he didn't like it when God's prophet Elijah told him to straighten up and do what he should. Uh, behave yourself or bad things are going to happen. Who wants to be told that, especially if you're the king? right? Who likes to be corrected even if you're not a king? right? How many of us are comforted by uh, having our flaws pointed out? My younger brother explained that's why we get married, so we can learn our flaws. Uh, and so Elijah was really putting it to uh, 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 King Ahab, and Ahab was uh, uncomfortable. And uh, and Elijah uh, reported back to uh, Ahab, and he says, I haven't troubled Israel. We're looking at verse 18 and 19 of 1 Kings 18. But you and your father's house have. In other words, that's where the trouble is coming from. And so he says, gather all your prophets of Baal. Uh, and there were 450 that Ahab had and another 400 of another pagan god. And they all followed pagan ways. They were worshiping a pagan god. And he goes on in verses 20 through 24. And Elijah said, okay, you've got all of these pagan god worshipers, these, pro or these uh, uh, priests for the pagan gods. Well, why will you falter between two opinions? If the true God is God, follow him. And if not, and these Baal, Baal or Ashereth, you just go ahead and follow them. So how about we have a little test? How about we decide uh, which God is stronger? And we read on through chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, and they decided they would take a bull and sacrifice it. And they would cut it up, put it on an altar, a wooden altar, and and Elijah says, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and sacrifice to your God. Put him on this altar and call out the name of your God. But don't put any fire under this wood on the altar. Let your powerful God show us that this wooden uh, altar can be ignited by the power of your God. And we read in verse 26 that these uh, <clears throat> priests called on the name of Baal from morning uh, until noon. There was no voice. There was no answer. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. So I'm sure they're going through gyrations. They've got to be proving themselves. Remember, there's what? 450 plus 400. So you've got a lot of priests out there. And then verse 27, Elijah at noon, Elijah mocked them. Well, that has to hurt. If somebody's pointing out things aren't working. Now, if things don't work for you, would you like it when somebody mocks you about it? Nah, 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 nah. I told you so. Well, I heard that as a, in elementary school. Things didn't work out. But here, Elijah, he wasn't particularly nice. He was rather sharp and pointed. What did he say? Cry aloud, verse 27. For he is a God. Uh, for he's a God, after all. You know, he's, he's powerful. He's either, is he meditating or he is busy? Well, when the King James says when he's busy, it was a nice way of saying maybe he's going potty. Okay, and they cleaned it up for this particular version. Or perhaps he's on a journey or he's sleeping and must be awakened. They're giving all these human attributes, or Elijah, because that's what they were doing uh, uh, and saying he's just a grand old human. So the priests, they cut, they what, cried aloud, cut themselves. We even see this in some religions today uh, where they will uh, cut themselves uh, um, uh, or switch themselves until they draw blood. Uh, and it says, as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out. And they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But no, there was no voice. No one answered. There was apparently their God wasn't paying attention uh, if he existed at all. It just wasn't working out for those prophets. Baal wasn't just consuming the sacrifice. So Elijah then said to the people that were watching, now they're drawing a crowd, you know, this is, uh, this is, they don't have internet, television. Uh, there's no radio reporting. The word is out that there's a challenge that's going on. And so if we took and look and we get into the thick of it here in verse 33, he said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the, the sacrifice and on the wood. 
four water pots. I don't know how big the water pots are. Frankly, it doesn't matter. Because he said, do it again. Do it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. Well, if a water pot uh, was a barrel or a small pot, and which is particularly odd, because this was a time of drought when water was very precious. So he's demonstrating at this time of drought this very precious water. Now, what they did, of course, is, is traditionally they would, uh, or that he would have a, uh, a little ditch around there, uh, you know, to save the water. And now Elijah cries out and asks uh, in verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned your hearts or their hearts back to you again. In other words, make it be known. Verse 38, And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Didn't take all day. It was a done deal. Now, when the people saw it, did they say, oh, that just couldn't be? No, it was quite different. They fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So the, our God is the God of heaven. And that's quite an identifier. And certainly the prophets of Baal found out that that the, that, uh, the God of heaven is far more powerful than their worship of statues of stone or wood. The identification of God is consistent with the second commandment. In Deuteronomy 5, reading verse 6 through 9, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So the summary of point two is the identification of God is critical in the model prayer. It's our, our Father who art in heaven. Point three, and the third section of words that we divide out is, Hallowed be thy name. In Matthew 6, in verse 9, we read, In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. So when we refer to God, we must do so in a reverent manner. Hallowed means holy, set apart, special, not casual or common or profane. Take a look at the second of the Ten Commandments. Let's take a look at the second of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 11. Deuteronomy 5, 11, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This verse is entirely consistent with the third expression in the Lord's Prayer, Hallowed be your name. We're not to take God's name in vain. It's to be held holy, special, set apart. Remember the family name of God was followed through and called upon by those who were called our Father. The family name is God. Jesus Christ called God the Father. The Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David are called our Father. Our family name is the family of God, and we certainly want to honor the family name. And in this case, God the Father is expecting us to honor his name and not use it in name. So point three is, hallowed would be thy name. So the verses to this point are, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Point four is, the next phrase, Thy kingdom come. I find the old King James sort of poetic here. and I memorized it that way uh, when I was young. Thy kingdom come is consistent with the fourth commandment. We're addressing the Lord's prayer to God the Father. But the first thing Jesus requests of the Father is to send his kingdom to this earth by saying, Thy kingdom come. In Matthew 6 and verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now let's look at the fourth commandment. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 12, Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. And he goes on to say in verse 13, Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your male servant nor female servant, your ox nor donkey, 
any of your cattle, um, nor your strangers within your gates, that your male and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Why? Why did he just make this up? Because it's part of the plan of God. This seventh day Sabbath rest that God commands us to keep. And he tells us it's important. The seventh day is a rest provided by God for our benefit. So we can work the other six. We aren't going, But what does that have to do with the coming kingdom? If we take a look at the seventh day, it points to that period of time when the kingdom of God is coming. There will be a rest for all of mankind. That They've put forth their work and their effort for 6,000 years, and a 1,000 years is coming. That seventh day rest uh, is, is that God is providing. And we will learn more about that in the fall uh, annual Feast of Tabernacles that pictures the upcoming millennium, a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, a time of rest, a time when, uh, when that which is wrong in the world will be put right. The writer of the book of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 4.4. 4. In Hebrews 4.4, 4, uh, and it's really pulling this out of Genesis. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. It's referring then in that time of Genesis of the recreation when God made clear the seventh day as a Sabbath. We're in Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he, meaning God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we have this seventh-day Sabbath, this period of rest for a weekly Sabbath for now that points to a millennial Sabbath for mankind. But we're also reading here that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, not sitting back on our keisters waiting for things to happen. Okay, why did Christ say he's praying thy kingdom come? In other words, calling on God to send that kingdom and do what we read in the Ten Commandments. The establishment of the seventh day at that time then pictures the thousand-year millennium. And after 6,000 years of recorded human history, Humans need God's kingdom. And as we read in 11, Hebrews eleven six, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not casually, not uh, uh, somewhat oblivious and like things are going to happen anyway, but diligently. And Christ explains about diligently seeking to the kingdom is a priority. And the oft quoted, you probably memorized it. Most of us have Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And it talks about the blessings. So the summary of point four, seeking God's kingdom is what Christ was demonstrating in the Lord's Prayer by saying, thy kingdom come, with reference to the fourth commandment as mankind can rest from his labors and then focus on God's plan. Point five. The phrase, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, this phrase can refer to all the commandments, particularly 4 through 10, with the Sabbath portraying the kingdom of God. Your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Jesus explained it in John 6 and verse 38. In John 6 and verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, John 6, 38, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is praying to God our Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we take a look at the Ten Commandments, we read through the commandments and we read about the benefits that are offered to mankind and understand the benefits, how we should honor our father and mother, we shouldn't kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, or covet. That's what God wishes for us on earth. These are values that he expresses through his word. And we turn then to accept the mind of Christ. 
to have that in us because Christ is modeling through the prayer asking that God's will be done on earth. And then when Christ comes back to establish the kingdom of God on earth, that is how, because that's how God is going to establish it. We'll have that kingdom of God where we'll learn to be Christ-like. For those of us that have the knowledge, it is our duty to do that which we know. In 1 Peter 4.17, that's reinforced in 1 Peter 4.17. We're still on point five, so that means we're almost half done. In 1 Peter 4.17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Well, we know that we are responsible for what we know. And that's important. If we have the knowledge and understanding, we must be more Christ-like. We must look forward to the model that God has expressed to us, knowing who God is, which God he is, and we must put our priority, thy kingdom come. And that is what God expects of us because God's looking at us now. So summary of point five, the expression, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, pertains to all of the commandments, especially five through ten, because that's how we relate to each other, how we react and respond to each other. Point six, give us this day our daily bread. That's Matthew 11, in, uh, or Matthew 6, verse 11, Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, this relates exactly to the fourth commandment. If we read in Exodus 20 and verse 9, six days shall you labor and do all your work. So we're given six days to get things done to feed our face, to clothe our bodies, to get shelter, uh, to protect us from the uh, extremes of the elements. This is allowing us to get our daily bread. And some people think God will provide. And all I have to do is wait for God. So an interesting sign on the wall some years ago, we can pray to God for our footsteps, but we still have to move our feet. Well, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it doesn't mean that we just have to open our mouths and somehow food will fall in it. At minimum, we have to lift the fork to our face. So when we pray, uh, this give us this day our daily bread, we can look to that fourth commandment. The six days you shall labor and do all your work. We must be productive. We have to do something for the benefit ourselves, our families, and others. But when we ask God to give us this day or daily bread, it's not like it's going to fall from the sky. And you say, oh, wait a minute. In Exodus, we read that, in fact, the bread did indeed fall from the sky. But those were special circumstances in Exodus 16. The children of Israel had come out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness. They were starving. They were anxious. They're concerned. And we read on in Exodus 16. God didn't say he was going to rain bread into their mouths. He said he was going to rain bread from heaven and he was going to make it available six days a week. They still had to go out and pick it up. And if they didn't, well, then they would suffer the consequence. We live in a society where sometimes people think it's owed to them and, and the bread should just wind up in their mouths instead of them having to reach for it, instead of having to step forward. You notice God would say he provide the bread and he does. Today, we must seize the opportunities that God provides for us and turn our labors into then our daily bread. There's also another kind of bread that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 4.4. 4. Uh, when he showed us the model prayer and he said, give us this day our daily bread, and that is spiritual bread that we read about in Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered, this is Jesus, and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. That's, that's why we have this book. Okay. Or we can learn about it to absorb it uh, uh, on a daily basis. And <clears throat> each year during the Passover service, we read John 6 and verses 32 to 38. And we read what Jesus said about the bread from heaven, how he was the bread that was sent down, that uh, 
to give life uh, for the world. In verse 30, John 6, 35, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So putting our faith, trust, hope, and expectation in Jesus Christ will satisfy that spiritual hunger. So Christ said he's the living bread. He came down from heaven, and if a man eat of that bread, he shall live forever. Well, God provides our daily physical bread for which we must be an active participant and our spiritual daily bread for which we must also be an active daily participant. But it's okay to ask God for that assistance. In Matthew 7, verse 9, in Matthew 7, verse 9, it answers that question. Or what is man, what man is there among you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Ever gotten any gravel in your food? Grind a little sand? Would you give that to your kids? A little sand in a sandwich? Oh, didn't think of it that way. But if your child, whom you dearly love, now, maybe a snow cone isn't the best thing to give them. My parents were always very reluctant for that. But they always gave me what we needed, not perhaps always what we wanted. So if we ask for what we need, God doesn't deny us. God the Father will provide for us physical sustenance and the spiritual sustenance. He's not going to give us a stone. Now, Baal was a god made of stone or wood or whatever they made their statues out of, as people do around the world even to this day. The stones don't do anything for them. But God will provide both physical and spiritual bread for us. So, The summary of point six, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. We know the fourth commandment is there for us to work six days and to do all of our work to provide the physical bread. And Christ has shown that God will provide the spiritual bread as well. Point seven. Uh, in Matthew six twelve, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We can look at this in Commandments 5 through 10. Some translations say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Remember as a lad growing up in a Protestant church in our particular denomination said, forgive our debtors. But the neighbor kids, they had to go to catechism and they memorized it the Lutheran way. Forgive us our trespasses. And there was much stir on the school bus as to the correct way to say the Lord's Prayer, as they called it. Is it debtor or trespasses? And the, But the principle is the same. Well, can we think of all the debts, meaning sins or trespasses, spoken of in the commandments, whether it's committed by a parent or whether it speaks of killing or some other sin? We can say, well, I've never killed anybody and nobody's killed me. But people certainly do slaughter other people's reputations, whether it's true or not. The worst of it is, is when they say something about us that's true and then they spread it all over because uh, it's really hard to defend that. People will kill other people's reputations, whether it's adultery, stealing, bearing false witness against your neighbor, coveting anything that's your neighbor uh, or anything. And our job, of course, is to forgive those who trespass or have something against us. It's one of the hard things to do. Because looking at the expression, what we're expected, forgive our trespasses, then there's this stinking little word in there that's really big, as we forgive our debtors. And a lot of people forget the as part. They're quite willing to have other people forgive them, but that's only half the bargain. The tough part, if it's, if it's hard for us to forgive others, it will be hard for God to forgive us. We must make efforts to have forgiveness as a model for us, regardless of which of the commandments have been violated. Now, this does not mean unconditional forgiveness, but it is that's another message. God offers us forgiveness if and when we repent, which means a change. So that subject we can explore later, uh, but forgiveness is part of the equation. So point seven, the fifth through the Ten Commandments speak loudly to the expression, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Point eight, lead us not into temptation. Point eight, lead us not into temptation. Now we could refer to commandments five through 10 or six through 10. Certainly some children could say that their parents irritate them to death and they're irritated to no end. So therefore it's okay to disrespect their parents because their parents led them into temptation. 
and then they could justify all the reasons for doing so. Just because somebody does something uh, or wants to do something to you, it could be tempting to get back, to get even. A, a better, more accurate way to say this is, let us not lead ourselves into temptation, because we're all tempted by human passions to violate the commandments of God. We can look at someone else who had human passions who was also tempted. We read James 5.17, and this is really a remarkable verse that speaks to each of us in James 5.17. Earlier we looked at when Elijah the prophet was confronting uh, King Ahab and the prophets of Baal. Uh, we read in James 5.17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Ooh, what's a nature like ours? Well, let's see. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, right? He had all of those senses and all of the emotions that we had. So Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Anybody here done that lately? Prayed for rain or the lack of it for three years and six months? But Elijah was a land of like passions. He had to confront and deal with all of those things, and God honored his prayer and brought about that drought which culminated then in that drama that we read about in, in uh, 1 Kings 18 in, and lit up the fire offering despite it being soaked with water. If a prophet of God who has a large portion of God's spirit was tempted just like we are and had passions, well, what about us? Surely we are tempted daily, weekly, monthly, and yet it's our job not to follow those temptations that we would lead ourselves into. One of the first verses I learned when I first came into the church was Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I thought, how can that be? I don't feel that way. Right? I mean, it's, I'm not, I don't feel deceitful and wicked all the time. Well, maybe there was a time here or there uh, where I was uncomfortable or thought some things I didn't. But over time, you come to realize that we're all human. Even the Apostle Paul fought temptation. In Romans 7.15, Paul wrote this infamous passage in Romans 7.15. For what am I doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Now that's older English. So I might modified into modern English so that we might say, when I do something I shouldn't, and I know I shouldn't, but I've done it anyway, and then there are things that I should have done, but I didn't do them. Ouch. That applies to all of us. And how painful is that? To the realization that there are things that we do that we shouldn't, and there are things that we leave out that we should be doing, and then we didn't do them. So a summary of point eight is, uh, uh, Paul's statement fits hand in glove into the expression, lead us not into temptation. Let's not lead ourselves into temptation because that's what the commandments are about, helping us to live a better life following those commandments of God. So, point nine, deliver us from evil. I've heard a better way to express it is to deliver us from the evil one, which of course is Satan. In Matthew six thirteen, we read, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In order to be delivered from evil or the evil one, we must understand what evil is. We must understand what we're to be delivered from. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. In other words, don't toxify your bloodstreams, stay wide awake, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seek, seeking whom he may devour. They offer overnight camping at some zoos that are big open zoos with very tall fences. And then they have an enclosure where you can go out, out in Escondido, California, and you can go camping amongst all the wild animals. And if you want to hear the lions roar and make your blood tingle, this will give more meaning to this particular, because they can smell humans. They know you're there. They can't get you. Or at least you sure hope they can't. Because they 
roar at night to establish their dominance. And you, you sure can tell they're hungry. Here we can read about evil and how it's lurking, the evil one. So we want to be delivered from that evil one. The evil one wants to devour us. Um, and we need deliverance. We're asking God, as Christ models in the prayer, for our benefit to be delivered from the jaws, from the biting and the roaring of the lion, from Satan who would love to tempt us away by violating commandments and then fall prey to that lion. So if we're going to be delivered from the evil one, we have to take an active part. And part of that is we ask God to direct our steps. In Matthew 6.33, we're not just direct our steps, we have to move our feet. In Matthew 6.33 and we've read before, first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So that's what we need to be busy doing. Uh, in order to protect us from evil and the evil one, we're seeking first the kingdom of God. We're so busy doing the right things, we lessen the opportunity for Satan to be involved in our lives. And then point 10, the expression, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's in Matthew 6, 13. This refers to the ultimate destiny as sons and daughters of God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Romans 8, uh, verse 6, 16 through 19, uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 16, we are the children of God. In verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. There's going to come a time when that resurrection occurs. This is our destiny. We're called to be heirs with Christ, heirs of God, to join the God family. Well, what does that exactly does that mean? And we look to Revelation in chapter 1 and verse 6 in Revelation 1, 6. And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever, which is a very long time. This is the Apostle John. Does that track what we just read in the model prayer, which said that kingdom come and John is writing on behest of the God that said we will be priests in the God's kingdom, and that he's our father and that to God belongs the glory and the dominion and rule forever. And where will this happen? In Revelation 5.10. And has made us unto our kings, a God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It's going to, he's bringing God's kingdom to earth. So we're looking to a time when God's kingdom is going to come to earth. It says clearly we're going to be part of God's family. It gives us a job to do, priests in the kingdom of God, and it tells us where we're going to reign. All of this is summarized in the model prayer. So let's take a look at this model prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. After this manner pray you, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we've had the opportunity to compare to the, this to the outline that God has given us in the Ten Commandments. And we read about our Father. We know that it is about our spiritual Father. When we read who art in heaven, we know it's the second commandment which describes God. With the third uh, expression, hallowed be thy name, we know that we should respect and hallow God's name and not use it in vain. Number four, when we say thy kingdom come, we know the Sabbath is referring to the millennial time of God's kingdom being established on earth. And number five, similarly, thy will be done on earth as it, in he as it is in heaven. And in commandments four through ten, where God's way of life will be practiced in this kingdom on earth during the millennium. In the sixth expression, give us this day our daily bread, is reflected in the fourth commandment, with the Sabbaths telling us that six days we must labor. And yet we'll also explain that God will provide spiritual bread for us as he did manna in the wilderness. The seventh expression, forgive us debts as we forgive our debtors, is a deeper understanding of the commandments 5 through 10 that we might have more forgiving attitudes. The eighth expression, lead us not into temptation, again, commandments 5 through 10, that we be not tempted by any of the passions, but instead turns our passions into a passion for following God. The ninth and tenth commandments are expressions, deliver us from evil or the evil one. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, refers to the plan of God, first to resist Satan, and the second for our destiny to join God's family. So when we recite the model prayer, let us be reminded of the great plan of God as codified in the Ten Commandments.